Hello. Jack Stauber's Opal is one of my favorite animated shorts of all time. Dripping with skill and craftsmanship between traditional animation and 3D models and live action, not to mention, of course, his musicianship. It's, in my mind, a truly inspired work that comments on many aspects of modern American society that are rarely gleamed from TV shows or movies. A deep, seedy underbelly that nevertheless is reality for millions of Americans. So before I get into that, let me give you a brief rundown of the general interpretation that has become popular and that you'll see elsewhere on YouTube so that you have at least a general context for the concrete foundation of Opal as a story, before I add my house on top of it. Following the titular protagonist, Opal, she's the daughter in an abusive home, serving both as the escape for her other family members and for the escape that she herself obtains through the billboard outside her attic window. The short reveals the happy family that Opal starts with are actually fiction that Opal escapes into for comfort when her real family pushes the burden further onto her. The three real family members are her grandfather, the blind man, her dad, the mirror man, and her mom, the uh, scary person that I'm scared of. We see this visually at the end as the substances of her mother, the eyes of her grandfather, and the mirror of her dad take on the form of Opal's face. It should be noted as well that while our protagonist's fake escape family sees her name as Opal, as that is the girl's name on the billboard that she pretends to be and escapes into, her real name seems to be Claire, as her real family exclusively refer to her as such, not as Opal. Opal, being such an unusual name, also asks for further investigation. An opal is a highly reflective gem filled with beautiful colors and light refractions. So the message is pretty clear in the metaphor for her being a reflection for her family, a sounding board, a person to rely on to fulfill their own desires or project their own insecurities. The grandpa asks Opal, referring to her as Claire, to retrieve her cigarettes. The dad comments on her appearance, taking pride and envy. And the mother vocalizes in her own song how she needs a little girl to rely on. And so that's where most analysis I've come across sort of ends, pointing out the obvious connection between Opal the Gemstone and the nature of escapism and abuse. But I want to dig into the meat of things a little more, zoom out the perspective. And actually, I want to add on two different perspectives that I think give a greater context and lesson for this. The first perspective is the societal one. Escapism doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's developed, produced, sold, consumed. What is there, after all, to even escape if not a non-escape version of reality? And what are the methods of escapism we see? Well, I think broadly it has to do with the juxtaposition of the ideal happy American family on the billboard and the reality of American suffering that goes often ignored or further abused by those in power. The first is the grandfather, who is blind, overweight, and seemingly has a number of other health issues, partially being tied with his addiction to cigarettes and addiction to the television. His song laments the other side of life that he can't experience and that he's been sold through TV. His song's first line, tell me, why does it seem so easy to breathe on TV, is a clear extension of this mirror of entertainment, whitewashing the American experience into something plausible but never seen, and a want to be a part of that life. Saying it seems so easy to breathe on TV while he chokes and gasps through his various breaths tell of a better life that he wishes for, but almost certainly will never have. He's nearly immobile, he's blind, and he's dying. While he withers in front of the TV in the dark by himself, with no assisted care, other than, I guess, Claire, if she agrees to give him the cigarettes, it's lonely. The dad, as he states in his song, they turn me down, now I live my nightmare. Gotta be seen by someone out there. He then continues to pick at his face and try to perfect his appearance, the dress clothes, and his insistent to improve himself so that others will accept him, the search, as he says, to shift himself, how life is a wardrobe change, how he needs to fit in with these roles so society will accept him. The age dress and also calling upon classic American imagery leads me to believe the turned me down was employment related, as we already see the mother in the house and the child. Either a job or a promotion, whatever so, it seems financially he's been rejected as not good enough. The idea that he wasn't good looking enough, though, wasn't, as he says, creating a rift with beauty and grin. It addresses another financial insecurity that many Americans face. 
I appreciate the switching of gender roles here as well, as often in fiction, if something deals with the concern of appearance in any sense, they always give the role to a woman. The statement that God is in my skin really reflects this self-hating narcissism, but also calls on to the strong evangelical movement, which I will get back to very, very later. That he needs to be perfect. He needs to be what society instructs. He has all the capability to do so after all, if he was made in the image of God. So he needs to live up to what he has been failing at. Again, the short comments on American standards of etiquette and beauty, and often how shallow they are and abusive to the average person without unlimited time and money to perfectly control their diet, exercise, and grooming. It's a statement of status and capability, but one impossible to reach without a lucky break or just being, well, born into the position to start with. Furthermore, we see the obsession to make oneself better as self-destructive, not just figuratively, but literally, as he tears open pieces of his face that he thinks are imperfect, and eventually, we see how hideous he truly is, likely of his own creation more than anything. The Mother Song gives me the chills. It's good art, it makes sense, and I'm gonna get into that, but I just wanna state that I don't like it. One, because it makes me uncomfortable. Two, because hearing it makes me uncomfortable. And three, thinking about it makes me uncomfortable. Essentially though, we see a number of toxic things with the mother. Someone who abuses substances, singing that she needs someone to hold her hair, and so on. The idea is that while a mother would normally be expected to do these sorts of things for her daughter, she instead relies on her daughter to treat her like the child. This concept is played with in the title of the song, Virtuous Cycle. Normally, the term would be a vicious cycle, and so Jack Stauber is sort of playing with preconceptions and common phrases to drive home the irony of this role reversal. A repeated idea twice in the only four lines of her song is her needing Claire so that she can be caught in her arms or so she can land on her to break the fall. It's not subtle at all, the toxic role reversal where the mother expects the child to mother her, but this isn't uncommon in many toxic households. Even broadly, the cultural idea of the parent who pushes their want onto the child or lives vicariously through them, if you've known enough people, then you've probably met or are yourself someone who dealt with very controlling parents who ask their children to give up and put the parents' priorities first even if the child is an adult in some cases. A parent should put their child's growth and stability first, not use it as a landing pad in case the parent falls. A child is not a backup you either, but the allure of something that you created carrying on your will is enough to often tempt some of those people into abusive dynamics. So what does this life do for everyone? It sells them the methods to perpetuate their suffering. The grandpa with his cigarettes, the father with the tools to tear one's face, and the mother with the substances to disassociate and further herself from the pain of reality, all while neglecting her daughter. And finally, what does Opal do? To bear with this family, which seems to lean so heavily upon her, she as well turns to a form of escapism, through the billboards. She lets them sell her a simple fantasy of a better life, the image of a family that loves her, that never existed, so that she can delude herself into believing that her life isn't filled with suffering. So there's the general lens, but further I want to talk about all of the themes and apply them onto something that I don't hear brought up, largely because many people who analyze this I think are from the United States, and as I am myself. I don't realize sometimes some of the things that have been on the rise since before I was born, because it's always been the normal for me. For far too brief of a summary, let's talk about the real rift in American isolationism and how it has been slowly developing problem that hurts everyone and stems from bigotry, leading to this ultra alone, ultra toxic life for so many Americans. I know I'm gonna do the classic video essay thing people make fun of, but after the abolishment of slavery, reconstruction was planned in the United States, a way to create a sustainable slave-free Southern US. Then Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and Johnson took over. Initially, people had hopes for a farther reaching reprisal, but Johnson was extremely conciliatory to the South and Congress raged forward. So despite the abolition of slavery and the claim for reconstruction, reconstruction ended up going through half-baked at best 
and failed to complete many of the said promises while essentially leaving the South with a slap on the wrist. Afterward, many states started passing laws that segregated communities, and not just that, but actively excluded black people from many places that white people could go. Despite this, the black community built themselves quickly, surprisingly so, and this is something often forgotten about if you, I don't know, talk to racists. In the 1910s, leading up to the Roaring Twenties, Greenwood, as one example, was a place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a thriving community. There were black lawyers, doctors, shop owners, and surgeons. Everything. Then, it was all burned to the ground. 36 blocks were entirely destroyed, before which the areas were looted, people were shot and run out of town, and after the Greenwood Hospital burned, all the white hospitals seemingly refused to help the people suffering, with one hospital making the exception and throwing some people in their basement. 10,000 people were made homeless, and 6,000 of those were shortly put into internment camps while people figured out what to do with them. It's dehumanizing. Keep in mind, this is three years after the end of World War I. So, sure, they weren't slaves, but people always talk about water fountains. Water fountains were nothing compared to being systematically run out of town, shot, robbed, and having your entire communities burned to the ground. Not only that, but most of these places were filled with corrupt police forces, something that was not really exposed until the famous experiment where a black police officer ended up joining the KKK. Not only that, but there started being laws passed to allow people who are criminals to be in unpaid work camps, essentially finding a loophole in creating a modern slave system, where you don't get paid, but you're forced to work, and you can't go anywhere else. And not only that, but of course, these white people didn't want to live by the black people, so they were put in the lowest quality and worst areas. Then we meet the America First movement, which was an isolationist nationalist group building in the 1930s and formed in 1940 partially, partially to protest the United States' entry into World War II. You know, the one where we killed the Nazis. They were opposed to that, and partially because they agreed with a lot of it. At the time, eugenics were also making a popular wave through the US. In fact, there's some reason to believe that many of the eugenic ideas the Germans got actually came from academics in America. And obviously, the people peddling defunct phrenology and race science were going to buddy up real close to that idea. Okay, I'm getting long-winded. I'm trying to go fast without getting too bogged down, but I still hope that you find this as interesting as I do. Basically, by the time that MLK Jr. was working on the civil rights in the mid-50s, he had already seen the aftermath and rising of the America First movement. Taking advantage of the social unacceptability of the Germans' loss and the unappealing association the Germans now had to eugenics, the Civil Rights Act was able to pass, allowing black Americans to vote, and was signed in 1965. However, one of the lead automotive makers, Henry Ford, who is not by himself to blame, but instead emblematic of a larger problem, had been expanding business from the time of Greenwood through World War II and now. Henry Ford, being an open supporter of the German regime and a notable public anti-Semite, cars were on the rise though, and along with other automotive moguls, plans to include infrastructure around cars were far incentivized while corrupt politicians bent and less and less infrastructural reform was made that accommodated those without cars, i.e. mostly poor people, i.e. at this time period, mostly black people. Similarly, due to redlining and forcing black people into these largely undesirable locations and cities, while these did also target poor white people and, in some cases, poor Hispanics, the intent and continued push was clear. Separating thriving communities from their resources by slamming large, hard-to-cross highways in poor areas and isolating people, essentially forcing a state of continued poverty. Laws then kept being passed to enforce that public school funding would be partially reliant on the taxes of those in adjacent districts, meaning taxpayer money went disproportionately into rich white neighborhoods, while black people were left up creek once again. Redlining was officially outlawed in 1968, however, these urban planning projects and the road initiatives continued to try and contain the effects of redlining. And that thing that I said about school funding? That's still around today. Right now, it never ended. 
Back on topic though, this intentional attempt to divide the rich and poor upon racial lines led to white people being hit badly in rural areas by these exact same laws. But due to the history of racism and the seeming decrease in their quality of life along with the increase in black Americans' rights led a perfect wedge for far-right and conservative policy to find home in these poor white neighborhoods. And this was no accident. It was to officially push down the social sentiment following the assassination of JFK. As the replacement president, Lyndon B. Johnson famously, famously, super famously stated, if you convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you picking his pocket. Hell, give him someone to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. And so the roads kept building, separating white from black, rich from poor, forcing a reliance on expensive luxury vehicles instead of building sustainable infrastructure through trams, trains, and so on like Europe considers the norm. Back to Opal, these rich racist moguls are selling you something that hurts you to make you feel better about your pain that they are causing. They are isolating and training you to become more alone and desperate, and when you fall and need help, they're ready to tear apart your body and sell the corpse. There's an interesting detail on the sign and home of Opal that we see near the end. Firstly, the road in sight is a highway with a billboard stating that Opal's Burgers is on exit 22, nine miles away. If you haven't been to rural America long, it's easy to overlook, but that's how many places in the US are. You live on a large plot of land, maybe in a small group or community, but Pretty much everyone is completely isolated, has their own separate fences. They need a car to get anywhere important, any kind of food, or risk getting run over or wasting your whole day walking. While you may be able to walk to a local bakery, pick up some cheap fresh bread in many places in Europe, nearly everywhere in America, the newer it is, is less and less visually appealing and amicable to human life. Shipping crate stores like Dollar General crush mom and pop shops and local bakeries, and then the people passing those laws are voted on by people being crushed by them. All your reliable places are global chains, nearly indistinguishable from one another, and the luxury of getting richer largely just means that you don't need to leave your bubble or engage with the rest of the world. You can get Amazon delivered and pay Walmart employees to pick out your products and produce for you and deliver it. You never even have to see them. The thing is, I love how convenient American life is, but the more rural and the more poor you get, the convenience becomes farther and farther away and all you're left with is the poison they sold you while you try to find meaning in a dark, empty field, isolated from the world, coping the best way you can. Opal is a true horror, a horror of the new American isolationism. The root of it and the consequences it's having on all future generations. In 2019, there were a number of teen hangout spots and communities that had sonic devices installed in Philadelphia that would hurt the ears and cause headaches of teens and younger children that adults couldn't hear. This was to keep noisy or annoying kids away from these richer people. The rural American has few third places left to find meaning or community. You have school, unless like many rural Americans, you homeschool, and you have church, which may or may not have many other kids your age available to you. The parks are in disrepair, the bridges are crumbling, and still, after decades and decades, the very people burning down this country will try to push the problem on made-up buzzwords like woke or DEI. The American soul has given away to vapid consumerism. The law, the roads, and the technology push you to stay in your predetermined lane. Opal is an American horror tragedy. To tack on an additional perspective, I want to draw attention to a different aspect of Opal as a story. That being the mythical second thing that I said I was going to talk about that you probably forgot I mentioned because I said it like 10 minutes ago. Now, I view this as more just an interesting lens to think about than the more clear overarching message. Another aspect of this far-reaching trend in America is a need for this parasite to latch itself onto Christianity in America. Not all, of course, but I think any Christian could agree with me that there are plenty of people who abuse the Bible 
to further their own ends. Look at televangelists for an example anyone under the age of 60 probably won't disagree with. And this isn't Christianity in general, of course. These are smaller factions. Because Christianity, like everything, is susceptible to human corruption, leading to hard right-wing evangelical extremists. The perfect ideal representative of everything that has been cultivated. Because if they can associate their evil with the Bible, suddenly they have the divine right, right? One of those things that used Christianity against Christians to hurt them is the conspiracy mindset around mental health in the broader sciences. Because as the decades go on, these hard right positions are tested and fail one after another, and so instead of contest the science, they train people to completely disengage with it. We see this, I think, as Opal showing the masking behaviors of someone who is neurodivergent. She's mostly nonverbal, has strong reactions to sounds and sights, covering her ears and eyes when overstimulated. She changes her personality to what the family expect of her in an attempt to fit the social dynamic, largely unharmed. But while she is ailed by this potential struggle, none of her family seem to care about her personal well-being at all or acknowledge any sort of help she needs. And I think you could make more than a tenuous connection between that and the general attitude and understanding of many people who are suffering in these situations and their knowledge of mental health. The way that Opal masks to be seen and not heard. Clearly the whole family needs some type of therapy or intervention. But here's a question. It's not their fault. Where exactly would they get it? They live in the middle of nowhere. They are poor, or at least not super well off. And on top of that, therapy costs money. The only thing that we see advertised in their whole world is a single billboard for a burger shop that's nine miles away. Just far enough to be entirely unreasonable unless you have a car. Mental health care isn't a given health need. It's a luxury for the rich. Further letting the average American roll around in the poor quality relationships, food vices, and mental health issues further isolate into extremist factions as those options are increasingly the only way to survive in these social deserts. And what do we want at the bottom of everything? Putting ourselves in the shoes of these millions of Americans of all variabilities? We want to hear what Opal does. What starts and ends the short of the billboard of the fake happy family as it reaches out to her. We see you, Opal. Your troubles are miles away. But the last line brings back that sinister nature of this relationship. We see you, Opal. And in our eyes, you'll stay. Thank you so much for watching! I'm sorry it's been a while since I have had a video out. I, uh... Well, I had a lot of different things going on, but I also moved away from my housemates recently, and uh, that has made me kind of sad. But also, I've, I've been setting up internet and getting my, like, I, I'm living on my own now, and there's a lot of crap that I have had to buy and set up and, you know, bills, and it's been uh, boring, so I won't l belabor you with the point. Um, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you would like to subscribe to my Patreon to support me or become a channel member or anything like that, if you donate any sort of money to me from anywhere, feel free to ask a question and I will try to answer it at the end of one of these videos. I will also try to uh, get back to posting more and also more often than I have been in general. It's harder because I do everything entirely on my own and some of these videos are really freaking long. I also hope you appreciate some of the extra effort I put into the editing. You know, I I've learned Blender and, you know, I, I do a lot of custom drawings and stuff like I did with my Disco Elysium video or, or the custom 3D animations that I did for the Lily Orchard and the In Defensa video. Uh, yeah. More content coming soon. Tell me what you thought. Please support and share this if anything resonated with you. And I'll see you soon.